Hi, it's Amy. And it's Tim from Go With Less. Thank you so much for joining us today and taking a look at our channel. Today we're going to cover a topic that we've actually covered in the past in a 20-part series, and that is how we retired in our 40s. What we're going to do today is a Reader's Digest slash Cliff Notes version of, those, of that 20-part series. Yes, if you were one of the people who watched all 20 episodes, thank you so much. I am going to put them in a playlist at the end of this video so you can follow along. That's kind of like more the autobiography of our retirement. But we're going to do kind of like a quick and dirty video so that I don't have to steer people to 20 videos to answer the question, how did you retire in your 40s? We're going to answer that today in hopefully under 20 minutes. We come out with a new video every Wednesday. Sometimes it's about our retired life. Often it's about travel, something like budget travel, ways that we can travel less expensive so we can travel more often. We hope that you'll join us by subscribing over here. And with that, let's get started. Today we're going to give you a list of 10 things that we did to make our early retirement happen. We retired in our 40s. We're going to give you some guidance on how we made it happen. That doesn't mean necessarily that this is the way you should do it or necessarily that this is the way that it has to be done. Also, some of the things that we're going to talk about may seem a little crazy to you. And so we don't think, in hindsight, we certainly don't think any of the actions that we took are crazy. Our life now, our retired life is amazing, and we'll elaborate on that as well. But before we started on this path, we probably would have thought some of these things were kind of crazy and a little extreme. But we're here to tell you four years after we retired that we don't have any regrets at all. And if anything, we regret not doing some of these things sooner. We'll start out by talking about our income, not the specifics of our income, but how we earned a living. Amy and I both were salespeople. And part of the beauty of sales is the harder you work, the more money you can potentially make. Another beauty of sales is that you don't necessarily have to have a college education to make a great living. Amy and I both do happen to be college educated. However, we had peers that we worked with that made great money being salespeople doing the things that we did. So while our journey had us making nice incomes, we understand that this doesn't fit everybody, but is there anything you can do in your life to increase your income? Maybe you can take on a second job. Maybe you can tutor children or sell things on Etsy or drive for Uber or board dogs in your home or get more education or certifications to have maybe a different job. Is there anything that you could be doing to increase your income? Obviously, if you're going to retire early, you have to save a lot of money. And that's something that Amy and I did from the get-go. We both, we've only been together for 12 years, but from the time I got out of college, the first professional job I had, I was saving everything that I was allowed to save in my 401k. And Amy was doing something similar. For example, if we had a tax refund, we would put that money right into investments. As Tim mentioned, I was also in sales and I would live on my base salary and save my commissions. Now my commissions could be more than my base salary some years and my peers would spend a lot of money and do extravagant things sometimes with big bonus checks. Mine went into savings. Also, I should say that I was a stay-at-home mom to Tim's kids for five years and when I went back to work, Every single dollar of my entire income was put into savings because we had already been used to living on Tim's income. So when I went back to work, we kept that income in investments. That's right. So in addition to our IRAs and 401ks and these tax deferred things, we also put money into just traditional savings accounts. And we did that along the way as well. And when I say savings accounts, I actually mean that we both were invested in the stock market. So throughout our investing career, we've had money in the market. While Tim and I dabbled with a little bit of debt right out of college in our early 20s, avoiding debt was something that was kind of a big thing. Even before we met each other 12 years ago, neither one of us had any debt other than a mortgage, and we never picked up any debt either. That meant if we didn't have money to buy something, we didn't buy it. We waited until we had the money or we didn't buy it at all. Yeah, and we were both incredibly privileged in that our college educations were paid for by our parents. And yeah. so that was a blessing, certainly. So we didn't have any student loans or anything like that. The only debt we've ever really had is a mortgage. Okay, so we've been saving our money. What did we do with it? 
we put it into low cost investments. And I'm gonna say that we didn't always have our money in low cost investments. Obviously when you're investing in a 401k, you're investing in whatever options are available in the plans that your employer offers. And so that hasn't always been an option for us. Also, I dabbled in stocks at different times. So did I. But so I think we had our money in the market throughout our investing career. So we've had our money in the stock market throughout. Um, I, we've settled on the right thing for us to do is to have our money in low cost index funds. Yes, that would include things like VTSAX, VT Sachs, which is a big fund for the FIRE community. That's the Financial Independence Retire Early community because it's a low cost fund that mirrors the entire stock market. We have money in bond funds, international stock funds, but none of them are extremely aggressive. None of them are expensive. And that's where we invest. That's exactly right. In roughly 2013, we were having a conversation with a life insurance agent, and he introduced us to this concept of how much money do you need to retire? And after the fact, we figured out that what he was talking about was called the 4% rule. At the time, he just gave us simply the math. Yeah, what is the 4% rule? You take your spending for the year and multiply it by 25 times, and that's the amount of money that you're going to need in order to retire. Now, it's a different number for people who retire earlier. It's suggested that it's 3% rule. So what that means is you take your spending and you multiply it by 33.3, and that is the total amount that you need invested to be able to retire. So 25 times your spending is 4% of the total investments. It's the same thing as just a ratio. Um, but learning that allowed us to have some number in mind of how much do we need to retire, and we are doing something on the 3% end for sure. Two quick things to note about the 4% rule. Number one is you have to have your money invested in the market in order for the math to work. And the rule gives you the details on what that looks like. The rule also allows for inflation. So let's say you start out with a million bucks and you're working with the 3% rule. That would allow you to spend $30,000 in year one. In year two, you get to inflation adjust that number so you would have 30,000 times 1.9% or whatever inflation happens to be at the time. So the rule has a requirement that you have to be invested in the market and it allows for you to inflation adjust your spending. In order to know the numbers for the three or 4% rule, you need to track your spending. Tracking your spending is something that Tim feels very strongly about. I certainly do. <laughs> Probably the reason for that is because I have been tracking my spending since my first job out of college. Somebody introduced me to Quicken and from there I've tracked every penny I've pretty much ever spent um, since I've had my first job. The reason that this is so important is because this is the math that you need. You need to know how much you're going to spend in your retirement or how much you're spending now to understand what you're going to spend in your retirement. So if you don't have that number, you can't figure out if you're going to retire. Also, tracking your spending is what you're going to need to do if you're ever going to work with a budget. So we don't happen to have a budget. We spend and then we go and look at the numbers after we've spent the money and that works for us. However, if you're going to keep a budget and try and keep your spending under control, this is the only way that you can make that happen. Now we've done a video recently on all the different options we are using for tracking our money. I'm gonna put a card up above so you could check that out later because it will give you the details. Yeah, it's incredibly easy nowadays to track what you're spending. Yeah. And here we are at what may be the biggest thing that allowed us to retire early. I'm gonna say that this is the biggest thing, even above my tracking. <laughs> And that is one where we lose people all the time. So I hope that you will continue watching, even though you may tune out mentally on this one. Spending less. When people ask me, how did you retire early? How did, whatever. I'm like, I should just put a tattoo on my forehead. Spend less, spend less. Spending less is, that was our key. Once we reduced our spending, $6,500 a month we took out of our monthly budget. Once we took that out, we were able to retire like that. Yep. There's a concept in the early retirement community called lifestyle inflation. The idea is as you get a new job and you make more money, you buy a bigger house, you buy a bigger car, et cetera, that's lifestyle inflation. So your, life in, your lifestyle inflates along with your income. So what Amy and I did whenever we found this early retirement stuff is we deflated our lifestyle. Actually, we like to say we didn't deflate our lifestyle. Our lifestyle now is more full and more robust than it's ever been. We deflated our spending. So by deflating our spending, that was really the key to our early retirement. 
the number one thing we deflated was our house. Once we sold and got out of our house, that was a huge chunk of the $6,500 was having the big house. And it wasn't just the mortgage payment. Yep. It was the lawn service and the housekeeping that had to come with this big giant house and the heating bills and the property insurance and the... and Decorating the house. All of it. Anything that yeah. had to do with maintaining a house. That was the by far and away the biggest chunk of our spending. But when you're taking $6,500 a month out of your spending, it's coming from almost everywhere. It came from shopping, it came from dining out, it came from entertainment, it came from- We sold one of our cars. Yeah, we, we, our cars. We yep. now drive our cheaper car. So we have a car that's less expensive to drive for gas mileage and all that and to repair. That's the car that we drive all the time, not the fancier car. That one sits in the garage and we're actually gonna be going down to one car soon. But the idea here is look at every single thing you're spending, everything, and see if there's anything that can be reduced. I'm gonna give an example of a conversation I had a few months ago. I was chatting with a woman who said, I was a single mom to six kids. I got spending less down to a science. And I said, well, you just let me know that you live like an hour away from your job and your six kids are all grown. How many of them still live with you? She said none lived with her. So she still had her house for six kids an hour from her work and didn't think that she could possibly reduce her spending a single penny and she really believed that. So be very, very honest. Where can you reduce spending in your life? We looked at everything and we've become experts in doing everything kind of cheaper. We are really careful with our money, but we still want an amazing life. We're not willing to compromise on that, but we don't want to spend a lot of money for it. And we still think that we have fat in our $36,000. Quite a bit of it. Yep. Yeah. So we're not super cheap and frugal about everything, just about things that we aren't that passionate about. The things that we are super duper passionate about, travel and our health, these things we actually spend quite a bit on. I'm gonna put a video up about our splurges that we just did a few weeks ago. So there are places that we actually increased our spending after we retired, but almost everything else went down. When we were planning to retire early, something that we had to seriously consider is where was our money invested? Not specific funds, but was it in post-tax money or pre-tax money? So those dollars that we have invested in IRAs or 401ks, we won't have access to until we're 59 and a half, unless we're willing to accept a 10% penalty. Which we're not willing which to we're accept. Which we're not willing to accept at withdrawal. So we had to make sure that we had enough post-tax dollars, money that we've already paid taxes on, available to spend to get us until we're 59 and a half years old. And that was helped a lot by putting my income into savings for over four years. What, what that meant is that we have enough money to get us to 59 and a half and beyond without having to have to worry about taking money out of that 401k or IRA. A little footnote about Social Security because I'm guessing we might get a question or two about that. We aren't factoring Social Security into our retirement planning at all. We have paid into it our entire lives. So hopefully we're getting something out of Social Security, mm -hmm. but we don't know what. So because of the uncertainty, it's not part of our financial planning. And we do believe Social Security will be there for us. We just don't know how much. So it, again, it's, it's hard to factor into our planning. So it'll just be a nice bonus when it happens. Far and away, the biggest expense that we have in our current life is insurance, whether it's health insurance or homeowner's insurance or car insurance, car health insurance. insurance. We, we, we pay for a lot of insurance and we think that insurance, if you have any amount of assets, is critically important to protecting those assets. So we couldn't afford to not have health insurance here in the States. One trip to the hospital could cost hundreds of thousands of dollars. So we have to make sure we're protected in every way that we could possibly be protected. And our very last point is we had a plan B. The cool thing is we didn't have to go back to intense corporate jobs if our plan didn't work. Because we brought our spending so much lower to $36,000 a year, we didn't need as much to live, and that meant we didn't have to have crazy jobs in order to maintain that level of spending. And I'm gonna say we had a plan C, a plan D, a plan E, a plan F. So we've been through multiple iterations and our plan continues to evolve. But the idea is if something happens with our current situation and the market goes to zero, we have a plan, so we have ideas. What's our about, plan if we go well, to zero? Our plan is we probably won't live here, we'll live someplace <laughs> else. We'll use geographic arbitrage to live someplace else where it's very inexpensive to live. 
And actually what Tim says, he's kind of joking around, but we do look at other countries as an option for plan B. So Tim's right. We have a lot of different plan Bs. One of them would be going and working like minimum wage jobs. Another would be going to a cheaper place. Thankfully, house sitting factors in here and we can get on the road and live somewhere else and not pay any accommodations when we're house sitting. So yeah, I'm going to say that maybe plan E roughly is going to be, we're going to be full-time nomads in a year. We believe it's going to cost us less when we are on the road and traveling full time than it costs us to be here in our current town home that's completely paid for. And the reason for that is because here we pay HOA fees, we pay a we pay taxes, we pay for utilities. electricity and utilities. So there are a lot of expenses that come from being in this place. When we're on the road and we're doing house sitting or we're living places that are less expensive, we believe we'll be spending less than that thousand dollars a month. Yeah. So there you have it. That's our 10. We would love to know, do you have plans to be financially independent? Do you have plans to retire early? Are there places in your budget that you can reduce your spending? Is there anything that you learned today about our journey that maybe you can apply into your own situation? So we hope that you will put any comments down below. And I've been pretty good about staying on top of answering those, right? Absolutely. <laughs> Amazing job at that. <laughs> If uh, you like the video today, please give it a thumbs up. If you haven't subscribed yet, what are you waiting for? Over here, please. We do come out with a new video every single Wednesday. And if you know anyone who's interested in retiring early and wonders where the heck should I start, please send them this video or share it on your social media. We'll see you next Wednesday. Thanks for watching. Far and away, the largest expense. Oh, a little more enthusiasm. Far and away. <laughs> the <pay. laughs> Not that excited. Hold on. Okay, you surprised me. Okay.